Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining us in this Good Friday service. We're going to have communion later on in this service, so I encourage you to go and get some juice and some bread now in preparation for that. Would you please pray with me to open the service? Lord Jesus, we are gathered wherever we are in your name. We want to remember this morning the sacrifice that you made on that cross 2,000 years ago. We praise you, Jesus, for the fact that that changes everything about our lives, and we want to glorify your name this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my riches gain. Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And they crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you who came to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. 
Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Father, we come before you today, the most saddest of days, to remember the death of your son Jesus and the price he paid for us so that we can be reconciled to you. Lord, we have come before you on many a Good Friday to remember, to mourn and to be thankful for your gift to us through his sacrifice. But today we come more fragile than ever. Over the last few months the world has been forced to face our own collective mortality. We are confronted by the spread of the virus, by the deaths it has caused, and by the way it has fundamentally changed the lives of mankind across the world. Lord, you know us intimately. You know our hearts. You know our minds. You know that we want to be in control of our lives. And now, more than ever, we are not. Lord, we know there is anxiety for all the uncertainties of health, jobs, food, housing and more. Our futures are unknowable in a very real sense. Lord Jesus, in those dark hours before your crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane, you cried out to our Father. Your soul was grieved. You were in anguish. Your sweat was like drips of blood. Lord Jesus, you know pain. 
you know sacrifice, you know hardship, you know anguish. In those dark hours, you called to the Father in prayer. In your anguish, you sought his presence. And he was there. He sent angels to strengthen you for the death you had to face. In our suffering, Lord Jesus, let us follow your example. Father, in our despair, enable us to be comforted by your sovereignty. Strengthen us as you strengthen Jesus. Give us the wisdom to seek you out, each of us in our own particular circumstances, so that we put all our fears, worries, anxieties at your feet, so that we may be strengthened for the days, weeks and months ahead. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We are grateful that you gave us a Christian Prime Minister for such a time as this, a man who is not ashamed of the Gospel. We pray for the National Cabinet and for our Premier in particular. Give them all wisdom, courage and compassion in these times. We pray for those in the front line who are caring and ministering in so many ways. Let them feel your protection over them. We pray for those who are sick and their loved ones. Comfort them and heal them. We thank you for Jono's leadership of Northern Life at this time and we ask for grace and wisdom for our leadership team. Lord, we ask that you draw close those who are seeking you and prompt those who aren't to question and open their hearts to your majesty. Comfort us who know and love you and strengthen us to love each other courageously. Father, protect us and remind us that you are sovereign and enduring. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In April 2003, at the bottom of a dark, cold chasm, hundreds of feet beneath the Utah desert, a man by the name of Aaron Ralston stood trapped with his right hand crushed under a huge boulder. He'd fallen from high above and the rock had plunged with him, finally wedging him immovably against the canyon wall. It was March 2011 and myself and another bloke from our church were heading off to Ethiopia. We were driving to the airport and I happened to say the only movie I really want to see is that one about the canyoner, 127 hours. Quickly his wife who was driving us said, oh I don't know about that, have you heard the reviews? Heaps of people have been hospitalised after seeing it, it's so graphic. Whatever, I thought. That night after taking off at around 9.30pm, it was 1am in the morning and I was one of the only people still awake watching a movie. 127 hours. It was going well. But all of a sudden, I don't know if it was the noise of the plane coupled with the intensity of the style of the movie or the fact that the guy playing Aaron Ralston had uh, got to the part when he was about to cut his arm off with a blunt Swiss army knife. But I started to feel a little strange. In fact, it was intense. The screen is right there and it's very graphic, very real. Maybe it was the lack of oxygen at high altitude, but I began to feel faint. I was sweating. I thought, great. I'm going to pass out and no one will know because I'm on the plane, no one's awake. And I'm going to go and choke myself or something. So I thought, I'd better get my head down low. Don't uh, I don't know if, if you've tried to get your head down low in an aeroplane, but it's dangerous. There I was with my head out in the aisle as low as I could get it, waiting for a food tray to come by and really like knock me out or something. I'm thinking to myself, you loser, you goose. Why did you do this to yourself? Well, Aaron Ralston successfully amputated his own arm. This is how he himself described the feeling that followed. He said it was the most beautiful moment of my life. He said the intensity of emotion, the euphoria, it was ecstasy. Take every instance of joy, happiness, pleasure, delight and fun 
you've ever had in your life and pack it into one moment, then multiply that moment by the power of every piece of joy and happiness you're yet to experience. That's how I felt. Well, the vast majority of the Academy Award nominated movie, 127 Hours, was about one thing. A truly gruesome, shocking, inhumane event when a man cut his own arm off to secure his own freedom to avoid certain death, to embrace life. Around one third of the gospel story of the life of Jesus Christ is devoted to one truly gruesome, shocking, inhumane event, the crucifixion death of God in human flesh. In this message, we come to the crux of the entire story of the Bible. Jesus Christ, God and man, on a cross, saving the world, securing eternal freedom, avoiding certain death, and embracing eternal life. The cross, it's the lasting symbol of the God who saves. Whether it's Adam and Eve, their son Cain, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, the people of Israel, Hannah, David, Daniel, or Jonah, our God is the God who saves. It's the constant theme of the Bible. Our God saves. And in Jesus, he saves through a cross. The cross has become a powerful and enduring symbol. You may not realize it, but when Christianity was in its infancy and the church began growing, Christians had to decide what the symbol of our faith would be. They considered uh, quite a few options. Some proposed fish and loaves representing the lunch the little boy gave to Jesus. Um, others suggested the rainbow, which was the sign of the covenant in the days of Noah. Others thought that perhaps a dove showing the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus at the time of his baptism would be uh, appropriate. Ultimately, though, the symbol which was roundly received and repeatedly put forth as the best symbol of the Christian faith was the cross. Beginning with the early church father Tertullian, Christians started making the sign of the cross putting crosses in their homes, on the outsides of their homes, around their necks even, as jewellery. It was a strange thing to do because the cross was, as the song rightly suggests, an emblem of suffering and shame, not the kind of thing you would naturally use to adorn your home or your body. Nonetheless, that symbol has persevered to the degree that today the cross is the most popular, widely known symbol in the history of the world. Christians constantly speak of the cross, sing of the cross, adore the cross. Why? Because God planned it that way. God chose the cross before time to be the way in which he would save the world. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. It was perfected by the Romans in the days of Jesus and it continued until it was ended by the Roman Emperor Constantine in roughly 300 AD. Crucifixion was the most barbaric, shameful, painful way known to die. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus called it the most wretched of the deaths. The Greek philosopher Cicero said that decent Roman citizens shouldn't speak of the cross because it was unfit for them to even ponder that kind of murderous death. Orthodox Bible-believing Jews understood rightly that the cross was indicative of one who was cursed of God. This was such a horrific mode of execution that Romans wouldn't even crucify their own citizens, only those who were foreigners and guilty of high treason and the most heinous of crimes. When it comes to the matter of crucifixion, it was such a horribly painful way to die, 
that a word was invented to describe crucifixion. The word excruciating literally means from the cross. Those who were crucified died by painfully slow excruciating death by asphyxiation. The manner in which the body is attached to the cross ultimately makes it impossible for the victim to breathe, but this takes a long time to occur. Crucifixions were never done in private. They tended to be performed in open public places. This would be the equivalent of crucifying someone at the local mall or in the city like where we are at the moment. Many would turn the event into sport. They would jeer and spit upon the victim. They would curse them. They would mock them. They would make fun of them. Often people were crucified at eye level on a, on a short cross so that all of their accusers and all of their enemies and all of their mockers could look them right in the eye and disrespect and disregard them. Historically, this was not an uncommon practice. Tens of thousands of people actually were crucified, including 6,000 people in one day. When Spartacus fell in battle, his followers were lined up along the shoulder of the highway for more than 100 kilometres. Before they were crucified, they were scourged, which I'm not even going to go into, but it was a terrible preparation which left a prisoner without skin on most of their body. The crossbar that Jesus was forced to carry would have weighed over 40 kilograms. The cross was a despicable instrument of torture. Isaiah 53 says it this way, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. That's how Jesus died. So what does all this mean? Jesus was executed on a cross. Isaiah 53, 5 says it this way. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities or sins. Isaiah 53, 12 says, He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Romans 4, verse 25 says, He was delivered up for our trespasses or our sins. Romans 5, 8 says, That God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 says that Christ died for our sins. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. 1 John 2 verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And Galatians 3 verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The cross of Jesus Christ is good news for us because of a very important theological term. And that term is penal substitutionary atonement. Let me explain each word in succession. Penal meaning that there is a penalty for sin. In Genesis, God told our first grandparents, if you sin, you will die. That's the penalty. The Apostle Paul says that the wage for sin is death. So the penalty for sin is death, spiritual death, separation from God, physical death, cessation of life. When Jesus went to the cross, he did so to pay our penalty. He suffered and died in our place for our sins to pay our penalty. Is there a penalty for sin? Is there a penalty that is hanging over our heads? Well, the Bible certainly communicates to us that there is. Romans 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Christopher Skates was a, an Australian 
businessman who throughout the 80s built his company up to be worth around $1.5 billion. He's a, a good example of someone who didn't believe that there necessarily needed to be a penalty for wrongdoing. He was convicted of fraud, and there was a chase for him, the chase for Scase. He ended up escaping to Mallorca in Spain and did a very good job of eluding the Australian government for about 10 years. Just when it seemed like he was about to be brought back to Australia, he unfortunately died of stomach cancer. Lots of people are good at avoiding paying taxes, avoiding getting caught when they do the wrong thing. But death catches up on everyone. And the Bible says that we are all going to have to give an account for what we have done with our lives. When Jesus is said to be our penal substitute, he is the one who carries our penalty. Over the years I've spoken to many people who have struggled to go to the next level in their faith. They seem stuck. What I've found more often than not is that these people have not had a genuine encounter with their own sinfulness. They might think they have, but there's nothing like genuinely coming undone, genuinely realizing, you know, I'm a sinner. I I need a savior. This is what happens when you have a life-changing encounter with a living God. Always, when people come into God's genuine presence they immediately say I'm a sinner I'm a sinner I'm unclean I need a savior if you don't know that you have incurred a penalty for sin in life I just want to encourage you to seek God to reveal that to you that you're a sinner like me and and we have the righteous penalty of death hanging over our heads we need a savior and the good news is that there has been provided a substitute. The next word, penal substitutionary. Jesus went as our substitute. Jesus went in our place. Jesus endured what we should have endured. Jesus suffered what I should suffer. He's my substitute. This was and and is shown every year in Yom Kippur, the Hebrew Day of Atonement, where originally a, a sacrificial goat was brought forward. The high priest representing the coming of Jesus, in fact, our great high priest, would then confess the sins of the people over the animal, slaughter it, its blood would be shed, and it would die being a substitute for the sins of the people. And then the wrath of God was propitiated, taken away. This was all showing, foreshadowing, anticipating the coming of Jesus. Every year, God's people saw the slaughter of the substitute and acknowledged that in the coming of Jesus, Messiah would be the propitiation of sin. Now, propitiation is a fancy word, a theological word, that means to appease the anger. God is angry at sin. His wrath remains on sin. Propitiation is to appease the wrath. When I was preparing this talk, I was thinking of a way to illustrate the idea of the substitute. Then I suddenly saw it, that the goat itself is not just a throwaway illustration. Maybe you goat lovers out there really felt it for the goat when I just spoke of him getting killed on behalf of the sins of the people, but stop and think about it. The goat is, is amoral. It's not capable of sinning. The goat is subject to sin, but it's not a moral creature. It, it just does its thing. Isn't that the the perfect picture of innocence? The innocent really don't know what's going on. They they really are oblivious to the charge against them. That's why innocence is, is sometimes mistaken for being gullible. Innocence is a good thing. It's good to know nothing of sin. It's good to not be worldly. Amen. The goat gets caught and gets a whole lot of terrible sins confessed over its head And completely with no fault of its own, completely without reason, without sin, has its throat cut and its life is given as a substitute for the sins of the people. That's Jesus. He who had no sin became sin for us, so we might become 
the righteousness of God. He gave his life as a penal substitute for you and I. Penal substitutionary atonement. Atonement. Atonement means at one meant. Through sin, we are separated from God and by Jesus taking away our sin, we are forgiven and reconciled to God. And we can be one with God again through Jesus Christ and all that he has accomplished in the cross. Galatians 2.16 says, A person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Well, what's he talking about? Let me explain justification. The Bible says that, that we have all sinned, and we, in a judicial sense, have been declared guilty in God's eyes. We sin by omission, not doing what we ought. We sin by commission, doing what we ought not do. We have sins of thought, word, and deed. To be justified is to have God as the judge say to us, not guilty. I declare you are not guilty of sin in your life. It may not always seem like it is, but it is a good thing that God judges sin. We know deep down that this is the way it must be. If I stand on your toe and you say, ouch, and I say, oh, sorry about that, um, and you say, grunt, grunt, well, you're forgiven. But if I was to kill you, your family is not going to think, oh, sorry about that, it's good enough. As human beings, we have somehow hardwired a sense of justice in us. We know when we sin, we are committing a heinous crime against a holy God. And it doesn't just get fixed by, oh, I'm sorry. Someone has to pay. Someone has to pay for sin. Galatians says a person is not justified. That is, declared not guilty by works of the law. This is uh, in incredibly countercultural in today's society. Works of the law tend to work in, in one of two ways. There's a religious form and there's a vague spiritual form. The religious form is that you try to be a devoutly good and religious person so that God will love you. The false assumption underlying all religion is that the only way to be justified in the sight of God is to earn it by doing your best and obeying the rules. And so religious people make lists of things they will and will not do. They seek really hard to do what they should do, not do what they shouldn't do, anticipating that one day, on the day of judgment, when they stand before God and get to show him their resume, as it were, they can say, God, here's my life. I did a good job. Please justify me. Declare me to be righteous and allow me into your presence forever. And we think that he will say, wow, you're amazing. Come on in. Well, the more spiritual form is not making sincere, hard efforts to be a good person, but assuming that what you are presently doing is good enough. This is the basic position of, I think, the majority of Australians. Well, the world is filled with good people and bad people. I'm sure I'm in the good people list. I'm sure I'm good enough. I don't need to do anything. I'm just a pretty good guy. I'm sure that I'll be fine. I think that's probably pretty common. The problem with religion is this. It leads to pride or despair. Pride meaning I, I feel like I did enough. Dismair, despair meaning I don't think I did enough. Religion never leads to hope, confidence, joy and peace because the assumption is you need to do something more to make God love you. Funnily enough, likewise, vague spirituality and the assumption that you're good enough is really nothing more than pure pride. It's an absolute sense of overriding self-righteousness that you look at all the people and just assume that you're better than most. Honestly, that is, that's just pure arrogance. So, so what does the Bible say about works of the law, religious works, good works, to earn justification? Well, in Isaiah 64 verse 6, God says, 
that your righteousness, your human attempts at being a good person, mine too, apart from relationship with him through Jesus, are as filthy menstrual rags, that is, bloody menstrual cloths. You might think that's gross, but that's how God describes trying to come to him on your own merits. He's saying it's a joke. Paul uses equally stark imagery in Philippians 3 verse 8, talking about his religious life before Jesus. He says that basically all of what he thought was righteousness is dung. It's it's a huge steaming pile of number two. Can I submit to you when you stand before God at the end of time that if you come with a handful of soiled menstrual cloth and a warm steaming pile you will not be declared justified in his sight. You see, trying to earn or merit God's favour is disgusting. Assuming that you're good enough for a holy, righteous, perfect and good God is disgusting. That's why the Bible uses disgusting imagery. The alternative is Jesus. True righteousness, justification. Paul says, comes through faith in Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Paul says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther rightly called this the great exchange. All of my sin, past, present and future, is put on Jesus. The perfect righteousness of the sinless Lord Jesus is then imputed or reckoned to my account. My sin goes to Jesus. His righteousness comes to me. It's the great exchange. This is purely, the Bible says repeatedly, an act of grace. We don't merit it. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's a gift that doesn't lead to the kind of pride or despair that religion does and doesn't lead to the kind of haughtiness and self-righteousness that morality, vague spirituality does. It leads to humility. I did nothing. Jesus did everything. And it leads to joy because everything he did is sufficient. The, the only way that you and I can stand before God and he remain just and declare us to be justified is if we have faith in and grace from Jesus Christ alone. This was the declaration of the Protestant Reformation that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. At one meant. This can only happen through faith in Christ and the justification that comes by grace through faith. Penal substitutionary atonement. God and man on a cross reconciling the world to himself. This is the crux of the salvation story. When Aaron Ralston finally amputated his arm, he described the feeling as nothing but pure joy. Hebrews 12 2 tells us, It was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As unfathomable as it seems, the Lord Jesus Christ embraced that one pinnacle point in history, not an amputation of an arm, but a willing offering of a perfect life unto death, because in his death he was making a way open for the salvation of all who would believe. May you know the power of the cross and the resurrection. May you know the wonderful freedom and peace that faith can bring you. Faith in the finished work of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus gathered his disciples 
on that last Thursday night and washed their feet. He shared one last meal with them. And then in a moment of significance beyond words, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for saying no to every single temptation. Thank you for living the sinless life that we could never live. Thank you for offering your perfect life in place of ours on that cross. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world who takes away my sin. We eat and drink to your honour, remembering that by faith in your finished work, we are forgiven, cleansed, and restored to be children of God our Father. Feel the world is broken. We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it? Does 
Of heaven, God's 
Stay here. 